Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session of our workshop on reflections on Juneteenth and America's racial legacy. Um, my name is Kathleen Canning. I'm the Dean of Humanities, and I am thrilled to host this workshop. And I also thank Provost DeRoche and President Lebron for calling us all together today and organizing these events. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Michelle Torres. Michelle is an assistant professor of political science who specializes in political methodology and political behavior. She received her PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. And her research focuses on making statistical and computer science methods accessible to political scientists. Her research fields include the study of social issues, especially in the fields of political behavior and public opinion. Her talk today is entitled Framing a Protest, the Determinants and Impact of Media Coverage. Michelle. Thank you, Caitlin, so much. And thanks so much for the opportunity of having me here. And thanks for all the uh, audience here for joining this amazing panel. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about a different side or a different angle of the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that we have been witnessing around the country. And I'm going to focus on media coverage and more specifically the way in which newspapers cover protests. Uh, I think this is an important topic because media provides information about an event. They set the agenda of what they think it's important for you as an audience to see. Um, and they have the ability to provide information that really can shape your attitudes and opinions towards political events like social movements. This is particularly important because it can translate into behavior. Um, the support that you provide the movement, the donations that you give to them, uh, whether you decide to mobilize and join the activities that eventually would lead to their success. Therefore, um, I think it's important that we should not only study what media is covering, but also how they are covering the protest of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I'm not gonna focus broadly on coverage, but on a specific part of it, which is the visual coverage. Basically, how newspapers use images to tell stories about the Black Lives Matter movement protests. And we know by common knowledge that um, visuals are important and are very impactful. Uh, images can be the symbol of a movement, like this very iconic picture of Martin Luther King Jr. representing the civil rights movement, or they can be triggers of change. They can mobilize public opinion, elite behavior. They can push for policy change by really highlighting the core principles of a movement. This is also a very iconic picture, highlighting the demands of the civil rights movement that eventually change a lot of hearts and minds, not only in the US, but abroad, and that it's considered a great catalyzer of change in the US with respect to the civil rights movement. In a more basic dimension, they provide information about facts and elements uh, and even um, like, uh, uh, like, like they provide information about what's happening in your community, um, what, uh, what things are, are, are happening out there. So um, as I was saying, in a more basic dimension, they provide information about facts and elements of an even uh, uh, of what's happening in your community of an event like a protest. Here you might recognize this picture in Houston of a protest that happened recently and it's just giving information about the mood, the environment um, of these events, of these protests, um, uh, and tells you something about the development of, of the movement. But beyond that, uh, images are powerful because first of all, we're constantly exposed to them. We are bombarded by them, we're surrounded by them, and we're exposed to them sometimes even when we don't want to. Um, second, image processing requires less resources than other sources like text. You don't need to be literate. You don't have, you need to have a lot of time to read the text. You can just instantly be exposed to an image and process it in a very unconscious way. And third, images provide and shape information. This idea that when we see something, we believe it. We get proof of what uh, someone is saying something. Um, and these makes images really powerful because they can frame a story in a particular given way, in a way that the author of a news or a, an author of someone that is like uh, taking a picture wants to, wants to tell you about a particular story. And a very iconic or like relevant example is the following. This is a screenshot of uh, an article that uh, the Seattle Times published regarding this news about Fox News altering and editing some images when they were talking about the Seattle protest and more specifically the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. 
Um, and this is very interesting because they put together images from different uh, images at different points in time and space to really create this composition of like chaos and anarchy, a very violent and like problematic environment using different images to really strengthen the message they wanted to send about this autonomy zone. Um, and further, like that was of course a radical example, but there are other ways in which we can see this framing operating in the real world. Um, and, and these images going beyond the facts that text can provide. So now I'm going to show you four different newspaper covers. They were published in May 30, um, talking about this protest, more specifically about the news that the police who knelt on George Floyd's neck was charged with murder. And the interesting thing is that the text of these uh, newspaper covers have, it's identical. They, it's taken from a newswire source, the Associated Press. And the only things that differ between these newspaper covers is the image and the headline. So here, for example, we see these protesters in, at night in this activity, very peaceful. Um, here we see a policeman heavily armed and while not doing anything particularly active or aggressive, definitely dressed as if he's expecting conflict um, or a lot of chaos. Here um, we see a little bit of tension in the environment between the protesters and the police, a very angry protester. And finally here we see absolute chaos, the culmination of a very violent night. So four different news, uh, images telling not even different parts of the story, but like using different sequences and different elements like time space to tell you something different about the exact same news article. And um, this motivates my question of like, how are these different depictions um, are affecting what we know about protests and how are news outlets using these images to cover the BLM protests? So first I can tell you a bit what I have learned from the coverage of protests this year. I analyzed a bit more than 2,000 from pages of uh, 539 local news newspapers between May 27 and May 31st of this year. Um, and I decided to focus on these front pages because this is where newspapers actually show what they think it's important for readers to read or to consume. Um, and what I can tell you is that a lot of these newspaper covers, a lot of these front pages are actually including or mentioning the protest of the Black Lives Matter movement. At this and this uh, contrasts very sharply with Ferguson in 2014, where a lot of newspapers just decided to ignore the situation and do not include anything related to the, to the protest in their front page. Another thing is that this coverage is increasing over time, even in these first few days where the protests were not at their climax, we could see like this uh, trend and by May 31st, more than 80% of the pro front pages included some kind of coverage about the BLM. Um, and an interesting thing also contrasting to Ferguson is that this coverage has been basically political. There are no differences in who's covering the protests between conservative and liberal newspapers. I think that we also saw in Ferguson where liberals were covering the protests uh, way more often than conservative outlets. But as I said, we should not focus only on what kind of things we're covering, like the protest, but also the way in which we're doing it. And to do that, what I did is I extracted the images from these front pages. I used um, something, a tool from the computer vision field to do automated content analysis and detect objects and relevant themes in, in the pictures. So some of these themes can be crowds, signs, police, fire, etc. And what you can see here in this plot is that uh, a high proportion of these images contain um, the elements like signs, for example, that's a very popular theme. Um, uh, but what is interesting is that a significant proportion of these images actually have violent content. So nearly 40% of these images are showing some violent episode of the protest. And this is interesting because although these first days, those were the protests where we actually saw more violent episodes, the protests have, have been very peaceful. Actually, that's, that has been one of the remarkable aspects of this movement this time, that it's been peaceful. So it's interesting to see that newspapers are focusing on that. Um, and in contrast, they are putting less attention to the magnitude of the movement. So we see a very small proportion of, of pictures showing big groups, groups of more than 100 people. As you can see, it's less than 5%. Um, and, uh, and an interesting thing is that while the coverage, like putting or talking about the protest is not apolitical, we actually see some differences in the way that they are covering the, the movement between these outlets. So for example, um, here in this graph, you have uh, each point is the image. 
In the x-axis, we have the ideological slant, like the ideology of the newspaper, ranging from liberal to conservative. And the more conservative the news outlet gets, the, less, uh, the lower the probability that they show pictures with large groups, a less focus on, on, on magnitude as you become more conservative. On the other hand, when we talk about the audience ideology, so not, not the newspaper ideology, here we see um, that, for example, as the city where the newspaper is from becomes more um, liberal or more democrat, the probability of seeing pictures with nocturnal elements or pictures happening at night decreases sharply. So the real question here is whether these differences that we're observing actually matter to build opinions about the movement. And to explore this question, I ran an experiment related to the Occupy movement protest. I didn't want to do it about Black Lives Matter because back then it was too salient and people were over treated by information. Um, so I chose a more neutral uh, protest with a topic that people could rally more broadly around it back then. Um, and what I did is that I gave my respondents um, a newspaper article talking about this Occupy movement a protest around the country and I just differ the image that they were getting. So very similar to what I show you in the real world with the newspaper covers. So some of my respondents did not see a picture at all. Some of them saw a peaceful protest, some of them saw a violent protester and some of them saw a, a violent police um, picture. Um, and when I tell you or when I ask if this framing matters, the answer is yes. Spoiler alert, the effects of visual violence are not positive for the movement. Violence by, by protesters and violence by the police both discourage mobilization and increase negative opinions towards the movement. So as I told you, I have these different groups seeing different images um, and I asked them different questions of like whether they thought the movement will achieve their objective, whether they share the views with the protesters and whether they would like to get involved with a similar movement with similar objectives, not even the occupied movement, but something similar. And the results here, these are the treatment effects um, with respect to the no picture category. And what we see is that regardless of the violent stimuli that you get, you are more likely to hold negative opinions. You're more likely to say that you don't think the movement is gonna achieve its objectives. You're less likely to share views and you're less likely to participate in similar, in similar movements. And another interesting thing here is that while both violent stimuli have this negative effect, um, the protesters pay a higher cost, a higher penalty for being violent. So this is um, just like a piece of evidence of how this visual coverage actually can impact um, what we know about the protests. So the takeaway from all of this is that newspapers use images in very different ways to frame stories. And this visual framing has important effects on opinions and support towards social movements. Therefore, it is really important to reflect on what kind of material visual and textual, we are consuming. We need to push news outlets and our news of information to literally gives us the full picture, or at least the most representative picture of the movement. It is easy to see why impactful pictures like the one that you're seeing now on your screen end up being really popular, right? Like they are intense, they can sell a lot, they are attractive. But we need to question ourselves if letting images like this really should be the symbol of movements like the Black Lives Matter if they truly represent its principles, objectives, and trajectory, because these might have an important effect on its success and its impact. And with that, thank you very much. Sorry for the technical uh, inconveniences, and I am looking forward to your questions and comments. Michelle, you have 10 questions at this point. So I, I want to tell those people who, who sent questions that uh, we will direct the questions to Michelle, and she can answer them to you individually. But let's start with the first one. Why do you think why do you think the video and imagery of the killing of George Floyd succeeded in sparking such massive protests as opposed to other recent videos of police brutality? That's an excellent question and I unfortunately I don't have a really good answer to that, but I've been thinking deeply about it, right? Um, honestly, I thought that the, like the brutality was particularly strong. And uh, I remember I was living in St. Louis when, when Ferguson happened and the Black Lives Matter erupted there. And I remember that when talking to people about Michael Brown and how unfair the full situation was, they were like, but we didn't know what he, what he did before. And the fact that this time, there's a sequence of events, I don't know if you actually saw, for example, the article of the New York Times where they 
map everything from like second one where the the people in the supermarket uh, call the police etc um really outlines this idea that there was nothing to blame for right it's it's putting in very blunt terms that there was no reason to to have this level of violence so this is one of the potential hypotheses i have but i really haven't i don't have a, a lot of data to back back up that that claim it would be interesting to to run some surveys or ask people about it but i i definitely think it's very interesting okay i'm gonna take the liberty of combining two subsequent questions um one is how did you determine what was a liberal newspaper and what was a conservative newspaper and secondly how do you define that an image is violent that's a, those are great questions um so i'm using a measure called ideological slant that is developed by two economists Gensko and shapiro and what they did is that they took all the news paper articles that newspapers have, and they analyze the language and compare it to how Democrats and Republicans in Congress talk. So basically the topics they cover, the way in which they talk about these topics, and they map um, the way in which newspapers talk to those speeches in Congress to determine who is more liberal or more conservative. That's, that's how I'm defining, I'm, I'm using that measure. Uh, for the second question, I, I'm using a tool uh, called Convolutional Neural Network, which is for image classification. So if you have seen some of the apps that Google has for image recognition and stuff like that, this follows a similar logic. And um, this model has been trained um, by uh, two professors at UCLA on uh, millions of images of protest that they, they annotated um, with uh, normal humans and research assistants to determine what their perceived level of violence was. So the computer takes all of these images, those millions of images, learn what kind of features like fire, um, police, yelling, emotions are in the picture to give a score of violence. Okay, great. So you just answered the next question was which tool did you use for analysis? So let's jump to the following one. How is journalism and photojournalism as an industry and discipline addressing the ethics of the industry and the medium. Are they no longer working with, with regards to these industry ethics? So I, th that's a super interesting question. Um, so I interviewed a photojournalist, um, uh, Robert Cohen from the St. Louis Post Dispatch a few years ago. And it was very interesting to see how he's super passionate about his doing. He really wants to just like show what the real picture is, like show as, many, as much information as, she can, as he can from these, from these protests and these events. But at the same time, um, he told me that of course he, they still need to, to stick to some rules and principles from the newspaper, right? Like, so, so he told me even this story where uh, there was a picture where there was a lot of blood in the pavement and it was not like a super impactful picture like seeing a body, right? But still it like gave you chills. So um, they had to go through, through the editorial board and analyze what the principles of the St. Louis Post Dispatch uh, were and things like that to really understand uh, if they could if they could publish based on their ethical uh, considerations, they could publish something like that. And I know that some other newspapers have similar principles. Um, now the, the discussion is again open. I think it was pretty dusty because it depends on the newspaper and everyone is like, well, you don't plagiarize, right? Like that's like a common rule. But now this discussion has been reopened, especially after the Fox News controversy, where are you allowed to like change and modify images and create a composition, um, even if you own the rights or like you, 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 you purchase permission. And, um, and now I've seen a couple of articles talking about it and how this is shaping or like starting the discussion about whether photojournalists also should have um, a new set of ethics and code rules. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, you now have at least 13 more questions in the Q&A. So uh, take a look at those and you'll be hearing back from, from those who, who, you, who you can't answer them live. Okay? Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next speaker is Professor Caleb McDaniel, who's Professor of History and the incoming chair of the history department. Caleb McDaniel is a historian of slavery, abolitionism, transatlantic reform, and the 19th century US. He is um, presently basking in the award of a 2020 Pulitzer Prize in History for his most recent book, Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. The book recounts the story of Henrietta Wood, 
who survived enslavement twice and 30 years after was set free and won the largest known financial settlement awarded by a US court in restitution for slavery. Caleb's first book, The Problem of Democracy in the Age of Slavery, was like his second book, a prize winner. He, it won the Merle Curdy Award from the Organization of American Historians and the James Broussard, Broussard Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. Today, Caleb will share his thoughts with us on slavery before and after Juneteenth. Thanks, Caleb. Thank you, Kathleen, and thanks to uh, the provost and the president for hosting this event and all of you for tuning in. Uh, I've learned a lot from my colleagues and I'm uh, looking forward to learning more. So as uh, Dean Kenyon mentioned, I'm a historian and one of the things that unites all historians is an interest in questions of change and continuity over time. We ask what changed, what stayed the same, what were the turning points in history? And Juneteenth, I think, invites us to consider those questions in relation to the history of slavery, anti-Black racism, and resistance in the United States. We can ask what changed on June 19th, 1865, and what stayed the same? Now, those are big questions, uh, and I only have 15 minutes, but we can start to answer them by asking two more specific questions. What was slavery like before Juneteenth? and what was slavery like after Juneteenth. Now, the history of slavery before Juneteenth may be the more familiar one, but uh, let me summarize very briefly what professional historians now take as givens. First, before Juneteenth and on the eve of the Civil War, slavery was expanding in the United States. It was not dying out as apologists for the Confederacy and even many historians at the beginning of the 20th century once claimed and Texas was the leading edge of slavery's expansion. In 1860, white Texans held approximately 185,000 people in human bondage, which was approximately one third of the state's total population. By the end of the war, some historians estimate there were closer to um, 250,000, a quarter million enslaved people here. With the state's cotton economy booming and some prominent Texans even discussing the possibility of reopening the African slave trade, there were no signs that slavery was going to die a natural death. There was also no sign that white Texans would ever tolerate an unnatural death for slavery. For them, slavery itself was natural, a divine institution justified by God and the supposed laws of racial hierarchy. Of course, that was a very convenient myth for enslavers who built fortunes from buying and selling black men, women, and children and extracting their unpaid labor for their own profit. In 1860, the approximately 4 million people enslaved across the United States represented some $3 billion in wealth to their owners, an amount worth more than all the railroads, factories, and banks in the country combined. In 1861, white Southerners decided to wage war against the United States to defend that wealth and their presumption of white supremacy. And when white Texans joined the Confederacy, they issued a declaration stating explicitly that they too intended for slavery to exist, quote, in all future time, end quote. Now notice I was very careful there to say that white Southerners and white Texans said that, not Southerners or Texans, because there's a counter history that needs to be remembered here too a story of struggle and resistance to slavery by black Southerners and some white allies who fought back against these conditions. That was true of antebellum black Texans as well, thousands of whom fled or attempted to flee to Mexico, a nation that had abolished slavery in 1821. For black Texans and black Southerners more generally, freedom in the antebellum period meant fugitivity. Now the tradition of fugitivity or freedom seeking continued during the Civil War and black Southerners ultimately turned the tide of the war towards emancipation by voting with their feet. Wherever US troops moved in the slave South, black Southerners appeared at Union encampments to seek protection, and claim their freedom. The great numbers in which they came, uh, like the oncoming of cities, according to one US officer, helped to convince Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation 
on January 1st, 1863, and to allow black men to, to enlist uh, in the US armed forces, as many as 200,000 of them ultimately did. So the story of wartime emancipation, as historians today understand it, is really the story of a meeting between the fugitivity of ordinary black people and the force of federal arms. Now, Texas, uh, however, is an outlier in this story. Of course, enslaved people here did not wait around for freedom any more than enslaved people anywhere did. But for almost the entirety of the Civil War, black Texans did not have allies in the form of US troops. In fact, diehard Confederates looked to Texas as a last stronghold for slavery, even in the midst of civil war. Many white planters forced enslaved people to march hundreds of miles from states like Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana to the interior of Texas, where they hoped to keep them beyond the reach of federal forces and freedom. By some estimates, as many as 50,000 to 150,000 enslaved people were forcibly brought to Texas in this way during the war. And that brings us back to Juneteenth and what is so significant about it. It was not, as is sometimes said, the first time Texans, white or black, were informed about the Emancipation Proclamation or the meaning of the war, but it was the first time that federal troops were on the scene to enforce that proclamation. And in that sense, June 19th, 1865 was a pivotal turning point and it's rightly celebrated. In my opinion, it should be a national holiday marking the destruction of slavery. At the same time, however, Juneteenth reminds us that emancipation was a jagged, uneven, and often violent process. Freedom did not come everywhere all at once or in the same way. Consider, for example, that some enslaved people in loyal border states like Kentucky remained legally enslaved until the passage of the 13th Amendment several months after Juneteenth. Also worth noting is that Kentucky would not even ratify the 13th Amendment until 1976, a symbolic protest that didn't stop its implementation, but signaled the danger ahead for the formerly enslaved. The same stubborn racist resistance to abolition explains why many enslaved people remained in bondage until 1866 in the interior counties of Texas, which did not itself ratify the 13th Amendment until 1870. Consider too that what white Americans and freed people understood by freedom uh, differed in 1865. Even in his famous June 19th proclamation, Major General Gordon Granger declared that, quote, the freed are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages, even if it meant working for their former enslavers. The general also warned that enslaved people would, quote, not be supported in idleness. And in Washington County, Texas, one army official delivered a speech explaining that although freed people might desire to rest from labor, perhaps even to, quote, celebrate their emancipation by a day or two of recreation, such an indulgence, he said, could not be allowed. The holidays must be put off until the crops are gathered. U.S. officials also quickly rescinded wartime pledges of reparations to formerly enslaved people in the form of land grants and supplies. With friends like these, freed people did not need enemies, but they had those too in legions. White Southerners resisted emancipation from the beginning and worked to keep the post-war world as much like the antebellum world they knew as possible. And in many places, they succeeded all too well. In August, 1866, only a year after Juneteenth, one agent of the federal government in Milliken, Texas reported that whites there were using recently passed state labor and vagrancy laws to quote, revive African slavery under another name and with increased horrors. In the decades that followed, those increased horrors included campaigns of white terrorism, lynching and rape, as well as legal systems of segregation, discrimination, and forced labor like the convict leasing system, uh, which I think is uh, an important coda to the work of the criminalization of black people that Professor Wallagor Davis talked about in our, our first um, session. By the end of the century, freed people and their descendants in the American South had gained and lost the vote, making a second reconstruction necessary with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act 
a century after Juneteenth. So I think we need to remember that these uh, were the conditions of unfreedom in which African Americans in Texas first began to celebrate freedom on Juneteenth. And that's important to remember as we enter what some people have described as the beginnings perhaps of a third reconstruction. This is a holiday that has always simultaneously been a protest. It's a day that asks all of us to think seriously about the changes and the continuities between the present and the past. Put another way, it's really a monument to fugitivity that has always and must always elude the grasp of corporate branding or co-optation by those for whom freedom's really nothing more than low wage work and maybe a day off. It's a holiday for freedom seekers who look back in order to look forward towards more transformative futures. To illustrate that, I want to close by looking back to a Juneteenth closer in time to this one, specifically last Juneteenth in 2019. On this date last year, Congressman, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee held the first congressional hearings ever to consider a bill known as H.R. 40, also known as the Reparations Bill, which calls on Congress to create a federal commission to investigate the history and legacies of slavery and issue recommendations for repair. Given what we know already about slavery before Juneteenth and also slavery and its legacies after Juneteenth, I think there could be no more fitting tribute to Juneteenth than that. And in my view, speaking as a citizen here, recent bipartisan calls to make Juneteenth a national holiday would be even more powerful if paired with broad bipartisan support for HR 40. But let me close by also remembering another event that took place last year, closer to home here in Houston, in Sugarland, Texas. There, members of an organization called the Convict Leasing and Labor Project gathered to celebrate Juneteenth and call on local officials to properly memorialize and remember the Sugarland 95, 95 victims of convict leasing whose remains were unearthed on the construction site of a Fort Bend ISD building in 2018. The, the CLLP, uh, led by its founder and president, Reginald Moore, is holding a concurrent Juneteenth event right now, and their fight to remember the Sugarland 95 is ongoing. I'm also very pleased to announce today that the School of Humanities and Fondren Library at Rice University have partnered to recognize Mr. Reginald Moore with three new funding opportunities that will also advance the project's research mission. Two paid internship awards named after Reginald Moore will enable future Rice Humanities students the opportunity to work with community organizations on issues of activism, social justice, and public history. And a travel grant from Fondren Library, also named after Mr. Moore, will enable researchers coming from 50 miles outside of Houston or beyond to travel to the Woodson Research Center, which houses Mr. Moore's papers in the archives of the CLLP to conduct research on these and other subjects. And I want to thank uh, Dean Canning of the School of Humanities and Dean Sarah Lohman of Fondren Library for their support. If you're interested in learning more about the history of attempts to revive slavery after Juneteenth, I'd encourage you to look up the Convict Leasing and Labor Project at CLLPTX.org. Join in their work and download a new free report that they have produced out today about the history of convict leasing and its legacies in the present. Thank you so much. I see some questions here for you, Caleb. Um, one is, can you share any information on how the Emancipation Proclamation was received in Austin, Texas, the state capital? Well, we know that the, the proclamation was known uh, to, to Confederate Texans uh, after it was issued. Um, I don't know that I can answer that specifically, although I think that resistance to emancipation uh, we know continued in Austin up until the end of the war. In fact, there's um, some, some evidence of uh, slave sales uh, even taking place uh, in the state capital um, as late as the spring of 1865. Uh, and I think that speaks to the resilience um, of slavery, uh, which is also something that we, we need to remember in order to understand uh, Juneteenth. 
Um, great. The next question is asking you to say a little bit more about what you termed the third reconstruction. Right. Well, I think, you know, historians uh, um, understand reconstruction, the first reconstruction, as really a transformative um, opportunity uh, to remake American democracy. Uh, and, um, you know, for a long time, reconstruction was wrongly understood by historians, uh, white historians, both in the North and South as a failure or as a, a, an era, uh, a tragic era that followed the Civil War. Um, but actually, uh, historians writing in the wake of what I call the second reconstruction in the civil rights era, rewrote the history of reconstruction to understand it as a moment of possibility and hope. Um, and I think that this too is a moment of increased um, uh, hope and um, creative thinking about uh, how to make the promises of our democracy real. Great, thank you. Um, we have one more, I'm gonna combine this question. Do you find the high rate of incarcerations of African-Americans as a continuation of slavery in some form? And the other question is, a, is related, would you say that the prison industrial complex is a systematic way of upholding the uncompensated and continuation of black labor? Well, I think, you know, there's clearly continuities there that um, historians have noted um, and other scholars as well. Um, Michelle Alexander, for example, has written about uh, mass incarceration as a new Jim Crow. Um, and I think those analogies can be helpful for, for pointing us to continuities. Um, I think, you know, there are salient differences, for example, between convict leasing and slavery that need to be uh, recognized. Um, Juneteenth was significant. The end of slavery was significant um, in that it meant that um, people could not be bought and sold and separated from their families in that way. Um, but I think it's true that, you know, mass incarceration continues to uh, pose a grave threat to uh, the integrity of African-American families. Um, and it continues to show signs of uh, um, disparity in, in overrepresentation. I think the, the roots of that uh, stem as much from the Jim Crow era and the kinds of uh, things that Professor Walagora Davis was talking about, more recent um, harms than, than slavery itself. Um, but obviously a lot of that does grow out of um, slavery and the era of uh, antebellum slavery. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to link two questions that are rather distinct. Uh, one is, why do you think this is not taught in public schools as part of Texas history? Is there a prospect of change for, in that regard? I'll add in. And the second question is, how can we use this not, knowledge to complicate Houston's reputation as a diverse haven? Good questions. Uh, you know, I think um, there is some some signs of change in, in the curriculum. I know that uh, in recent months, the uh, State Board of Education has approved an African American studies course as an elective for uh, students in Texas. And I, I think that that's a, a good sign. I know that in Fort Bend uh, IST, there are some dedicated educators working uh, to try to, um, you know, bring local uh, stories like the story of the Sugar Land 95 to students. I think that's one of the most powerful ways that we can uh, connect history to the present. I'm thinking of Professor Bradder's uh, points about the um, importance of place and history. Uh, and so I think that um, understanding Houston's history and, and uh, connecting it to things that we know, you know, right here in Houston, Emancipation Park um, was in some ways the birthplace of the celebration of Juneteenth by formerly enslaved people who pooled together the resources to purchase that uh, that area and use it for those celebrations, um, despite the fact that you know it was later ceded to the city and turned into a segregated park, um, despite resistance from city leaders who in the 1890s uh, renamed the streets around Emancipation Park after Confederate Texans, including uh, Dick Dowling, whose role in the Battle of Sabine Pass arguably delayed uh, emancipation in Texas for two years uh, to, to Juneteenth. So these are, these are places here in Houston um, and names and histories here in Houston uh, that I think could help to bring these stories to life for um, students in our increasingly diverse city. I think we do have to 
to be careful of not assuming that um, our, our demographic diversity means that that history has been confronted or, or is widely known. Um, okay. Um, okay, we're out of time now, Caleb, but you have many questions in the Q&A. So I think you have the option of either um, going into the Q&A and typing answers as you wish, or we will forward those questions to you and you can respond that way. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caleb. Um, our next speaker is Professor James Sidbury. He is the Andrew W. Mellon Distinguished Professor of Humanities, and he joined the Rice faculty in 2011 from UT Austin. He's a historian of race and slavery in the English-speaking Atlantic world from the 17th to the 19th century with a special interest in the ways that non-elite peoples conceived of their histories and their collective identities. He teaches grad and undergrad courses on Atlantic history, early North American history, and the history of race and slavery in the US and the Caribbean. And his most recent book, or his last book is called Becoming African in America, Race and Nation in the Early Black Atlantic. And he is currently at work on a synthetic book, analyzing the era of the American Revolution as an era of race formation. The book will explain how and why many African peoples, European peoples, and Native peoples living in what became the U.S. each developed a sense of racial identity as respectively Black, White, and Red people sometime between 1750 and 1815. We welcome Jim Sidbury. Thanks, Kathleen. And um, I too would like to um, thank the President and the Provost for organizing this. Um, and for inviting me. I'm, I'm grateful for, but um, also somewhat daunted by the opportunity to speak to all of you on this June team. It's fair to say that historians, and as Kathleen told you, that's what I am, um, are asked to address moments like this in the hope that we can offer suggestions about the lessons we might learn from history. Each time I get asked to make such suggestions, I remind myself of a passage that the great Southern historian C. Van Woodward wrote more than 50 years ago in an anthology called The Burden of Southern History. After noting that Americans' experiences in uh, the First World War had taught them to be leery of foreign entanglement, a lesson that proved less than helpful during the rise of fascism in the 1930s, and that their experiences in World War II taught them the importance of early and forceful intervention, which proved also less than helpful when deciding how to respond to anti-colonial movements in Southeast Asia. Woodward expressed the concern that one lesson that history teaches might be that people are far too prone to learn the wrong lessons from history. Those of you who've read the book will recall that Woodward's ob observation did not stop him from suggesting that there were things he might teach us by attending to the past. And my indication of his warning will not stop me either. But I wanna preface my remarks with that note of caution. At this moment, it's especially obvious I, to me and I think to most of us, that those of us who are privileged to speak from the perches in the academy can do so but we need to do so with some modesty, and we need to spend some time listening to those who are speaking from dorm rooms, from locker rooms, and from activist groups, because theirs are the ideas that are really driving the most hopeful movements for change right now. Now, having said that, I will, like the academic that I am, largely ignore the warning that I've given myself, and I'm gonna offer some thoughts about what Juneteenth's historical legacy might have to say to us on this Juneteenth. In doing that, I wanna riff off riff on the tension that Martin Luther King Jr. sometimes drew between two qualities, the quality of urgency and the quality of patience. Now the tension between urgency and patience helped structure King's famous letter from Birmingham jail. As most of you probably know, Dr. King had been invited to Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 by local activists who were fighting segregation in what was colloquially called America's most segregated city. Bull Connor, the deeply racist commissioner of public safety in Birmingham, famously used attack dogs and fire hoses to enforce the racial order. King was arrested at a nonviolent demonstration and thrown in jail. While there, he learned of a letter signed by eight white clergymen in Birmingham that denounced outside meddling in Birmingham's problems and called on local blacks notwithstanding what the clergyman called the 
natural impatience of people who feel their hopes are slow in being realized, end quote, to stay out of the streets and rely on quiet negotiations with civic leaders and on the court system to bring justice. King responded from his jail cell with a letter that has entered the canon of American literature. He introduced the phrase, the fierce urgency of now, which he would use, reuse a few months later in Washington when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And he contrasted the fierce urgency of now with the moderate white clergy's counsel of patience. Now I start with this because I think this Juneteenth may be one of those moments, and, and Caleb alluded to this, I think, in history when invoking the fierce urgency of now might be more than an aspiration. That's in part because we have witnessed a crime wave on our screens while sheltering in place. It's a crime wave that has been captured on video by news teams and regular folks carrying cell phones. It's a crime wave that has sometimes involved individual criminals acting on their own, but that has too often been carried out by organized groups operating under the orders of command structure and conspiring to cover up for one another should anyone have the temerity to hold them responsible for their crimes. It stands out from earlier crime waves as they have been discussed by most politicians and members of the press because it's a crime wave that has been perpetrated by the police. It has included shooting innocent demonstrators and even bystanders with so-called less lethal weapons. It has included sexually assaulting a young woman in Indianapolis in front of hundreds of other demonstrators. Excuse me. It has included assaults on journalists filming criminal activity. It has included two Atlanta college students being pulled from their car and tased. This includes, included slashing the tires of journalists' cars in order to make it more difficult for them to do their jobs. This included the assault and battery of a 75-year-old man who had the nerve to try to speak to advancing officers. It has included much, much more than this. An activist has created a Google spreadsheet linking to more than 800 videos of police violence during the overwhelmingly peaceful protests of the last couple of weeks we are clearly experiencing a crime wave. All of this has been done to suppress demands for change that were stimulated by a Minneapolis policeman's brutal and cold-blooded murder of George Floyd, a murder that he carried out openly in the streets of the city with the obvious expectation that he was immune from any consequences that might result from Mr. Floyd's death. The murder of Mr. Floyd is, of course, a reminder that the crime wave did not begin when it finally began to show up on our screens. But one of the things that makes this an especially promising moment of potential change is that it has appeared on our screens, and it has done so in ways that have made it impossible for many to ignore. That is what makes the fierce urgency of now potentially so much more than an aspiration. That's what calls on all of us to push urgently for fundamental changes in both the immediate problem, the relationship between policing and society, but especially between policing and communities and color but just as importantly, the underlying problems that fuel the immediate one, which are the racism that pervades American institutions more generally, and the economic, educational, and social inequality that racism fuels. Now this is, I suppose, the moment in which conventionally one might step forward with a set of policy recommendations, but it's here that I'm actually going to heed my earlier self-admonition. I don't surprise, suppose it will surprise anyone who can see me on their screens, to hear that my interactions with police officers have been almost universally respectful and, setting aside a couple of times that I've been stopped for speeding, helpful. I have never feared for my personal safety during an encounter with the police. I have been and remain grateful to the police officers who have helped me in various moments in my life. I am, in short, not the right person to offer prescriptions about the changes that need to take place. For that, I prefer to listen to what those who have firsthand experience with these problems think is needed and to act with urgency in support of them. Instead, I want to return to that other quality that Dr. King discussed, patience, and argue that one of the lessons of the first Juneteenth and of so many other moments of progressive social change in our past is that we need to complement our commitment to the fierce urgency of now with a particular kind of patience. It is not a patience that is meant to temper urgency. It's a patience necessary to sustain, to sustain a struggle to overcome problems that are rooted in centuries of history. Such victories can rarely be won quickly. To explain what I mean, 
Let's return very briefly to June 19, 1865, when General Gordon Granger led Union troops into Galveston to announce that slavery was abolished. He instituted a moment with rich possibility. Texans of African descent, like other Southerners of African descent, seized the moment with urgency. Reconstruction governments included black office holders, and they passed laws seeking to ensure more equal opportunity and treatment for people regardless of their race. Public school systems were created. Equal treatment under the laws was mandated. Voting rights were protected. For somewhere between a few years in some states to a decade or so in others, Southern state governments allied with Washington to try to overcome the legacies of slavery and the force of racism. But by 1877, while Southerners of African descent remained committed to that struggle, their white allies in the North lost patience. How long, white Northerners began to ask, should they be expected to keep supporting Southern Black struggles for human rights? They decided the time had come to withdraw from the South to cease enforcing federal laws, and to leave the freed people of the South to fend for themselves. We all know what happened. White armed groups used violence and terror to end black voting, and the so-called redeemer governments that they elected instituted formal segregation and informal regimes of lynching and chain gangs. Reconstruction reformers in the North did not lack an appreciation for what Dr. King would later call the fierce urgency of now. What they lacked was the patience necessary to stick with their reforms and see through the radical changes that they envisioned. Now I realize that we're not in a history class, so I'm gonna restrict myself to one more example, this one much more recent. In 2003, the Supreme Court heard a case involving the University of Michigan Law School's use of race as one factor, just one, among many, in admissions decisions. The history of affirmative action the history of affirmative action and higher education is, of course, a long and complicated one, and I don't want to review it here. Instead, I want to focus on one aspect of the justice's opinions in the case to illustrate something about the absence of patience. Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the majority decision, holding that Mission's admissions process met the standard of strict scrutiny necessary to allow the use of race in admissions. But in doing so, she specifically engaged with the law school's expressed hope that it could, and I'm quoting, terminate its use of racial preference as soon as practical, end quote. Now, how long did she expect it to take before it would be practical, practicable to allow the consideration of race as one factor among many in the holistic evaluation of applicants? That is, as an incredibly mild remedy to approximately 400 years of discrimination. How long did she think that would be needed? The court expects, she wrote, that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. I suspect you will all join with me in relief in knowing that the Supreme Court has promised that we're just eight years away from escaping the scourge of racism in our society. Now, to be fair, Justice Ginsburg did practice the art of devastating understatement when she wrote in her concurring opinion that uh, one may hope, but not firmly forecast, the progress that O'Connor had so blithely predicted. But Justice Rehnquist in his dissent complained that, quote, a possible 25 year limitation amounted to a seemingly permanent basis. Apparently 25 years was far too open-ended a commitment for him. Anything designed to address racism needed to do its work much more swiftly than that. Now I want to acknowledge that the contours of this specific argument were shaped by the constitutional doctrine of strict scrutiny in ways that I'm ignoring intentionally because I don't think they're particularly important for the larger point. The larger point being that American society's commitment to addressing racial in inequity during those all too rare moments when American society has made such a commitment has been plagued by a refusal to confront the fact that deeply rooted problems require both radical action and true persistence if changes to occur. Moments of hopeful reform have too often faded away, leaving underlying problems unaddressed as O'Connor's suggestion that a centuries-long set of crimes could be made right with 25 years of goodwill suggests, there may be a conviction buried somewhere deep in American psyches that we can only devote so much time to righting racial wrongs. The reform that fails to achieve immediate change is reform that has failed. 
Like most of you, I've been heart hardened by the immediate response that the brutal and public murder of George Floyd has elicited, and hardened as well by the outrage that is inspired by the police crime wave that we have all witnessed on our televisions and computers. But like most of you, I think it is crucial that we seize this moment, also like most of you, I think it's crucial that we seize this moment to change many things that are fundamentally wrong in our society. All of this, I want to be clear, I believe in my capacity of a citizen rather than because I'm a historian. All of this, of course, represents the fierce urgency of now. It's as a citizen, but also more specifically as a historian, that I want to make an appeal for the kind of patience I've been discussing. The course of events from the first Juneteenth through the end of Reconstruction, as well as that of the many moments of reform that have ensued since 1865, suggests that we must prepare ourselves. We, especially those of us not directly targeted by these injustices, must prepare for the fact that the reforms that are passed, even those that work, will only continue to work if we remain committed to ensuring that they do so. We must prepare for the fact that some of the reforms that are passed will fail to accomplish the changes they target. Many reforms fail. When that happens, we cannot resign ourselves to the intractability of the problems and give up on the change that we seek. In the spirit of those who responded to the end of Reconstruction by fighting and too often dying or languishing on pr prison farms for their rights, we need to acknowledge that no matter how urgently we act, the struggle against these problems is going to be long and hard. It's going to require patience, but a patience that sustains rather than tempers the fierce urgency of now. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Um, what a wonderful panel. We have uh, several questions in the Q&A and they go in several different directions. So let me start with one that's somewhat philosophical and historical. What are your thoughts on how we can most effectively rely on the lessons of the past while embracing the power of our lived experiences to move forward? Oh, wow. I mean, that's both a great question and um, a complicated one. I, I guess the short answer I would give is that I think what our shared past gives to us collectively is the same thing that what I think our individual past gives to us. That is who any one of us is as a person is the, the summation of what we've experienced over their, our lives, who we've loved over our lives, how we've experienced all sorts of things. And, and we face every, every new experience we have with what we have accumulated through that experience. I think that's true of societies and, and cultures as well. And, and so I think it's a mistake to look to the past for the kinds of lessons where you say, this is what happened then, that was the result, I'm going to do that. That's what Woodward was referring to when he was talking about the tendency to learn the wrong lessons from the past. I think instead, the, the way that the past most powerfully informs or can most powerfully inform what we do in the present is by giving us a much fuller and richer sense of who we are uh, um, as, a, as a society, what we like about who we are as a society, and just as importantly, what we don't like about who we are as a society, and thus how we can go about trying to do something uh, uh, to make ourselves better and, our, and both individually and collectively. Great. I'm going to ask one last one, and then maybe you can respond to the questioners. Um, after your talk is over. Higher education remains primarily white institutional space. It is important for these institutions to commit to the urgency you speak of by diversifying the decision-making leadership and faculty that educate our students. Do you feel our higher ed institutions really have the willpower to do this, really have this will? Do they have? Oh, that's another great question. Um, I, I can certainly take it out that when you ask it as whether I think higher education as a whole do, I fear no, it does not. I, I, I think what we can hope for is in the institutions we um, all work in that we can do our best to make those institutions have that. Um, I think there are really quite easy ways to do that that never get 
It's just not easy ways. But there are ways that we can make really huge strides towards doing that that never get discussed, you know, including going away from the kind of fetishization of individual difference that we use in, in admissions and, and having some kind of much more random notion of who we admit to institutions uh, um, in which we could shoot for different kinds of balance that we did. I don't think, if I'm being honest, that we have the willpower to do that now. I think those are the kinds of um, uh, changes that hopefully this moment um, that Caleb was hopefully referring to as a third reconstruction can put on the table and can make us begin to, to think more seriously about. Great. So we're out of time. Thank you to all three of our wonderful panelists. And I will now uh, mute myself and wipe out the video and we'll move on to the next event hosted by Dr. Roland Smith and featuring Captain Paul Matthews.